Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another edition of the Mill Georgia Spotlight. I'm your host, Jack Ellis. We're glad to have you with us this week, as we're glad to have you with us every week. Let me say at the beginning that this program is made possible by uh, uh, contributions from Caduceus Medicine, J. Franklin Automotive, and, of course, the good people here at WMUB, uh, Channel 38 at Mercer University. Let me hasten also to add that the views expressed on this show, not necessarily those of Mercer University, WMUB, or even our sponsors, but the views of the producer and the host. In the spotlight this week, no stranger to the Middle Georgia spotlight. He's been in the spotlight many years, many times, many years here in Middle Georgia. Uh, Dr. Chester Fontenot, who is the uh, professor of Africana Studies at Mercer University, and he's also an ordained minister, so I won't call him Reverend today, but I will make sure my language is, uh, is, 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 is in line, fit in uh, uh, so far faster. Good, good to see you. Uh, oh, good to see you, too. Professor, and I appreciate you being here. Why I ask you to come back this, first of all, happy holidays, happy Kwanzaa, and we'll talk a little bit about Kwanzaa, right. but we're approaching the holiday season. I wish you a happy, happy holiday season. Um, I know you've been working on projects dealing with the, uh, the Africana uh, Encyclopedia, W.B. Du Bois in Ghana. I know you worked there. You work, and so now you're working on another pro project. You've been working in a courthouse, I understand, right, documenting slave. records right. of slave. Right. And now you're working. Tell us, uh, how do you find time to do all this? And tell us about the project at the courthouse and the oral history of the video history project that you're working yeah. on as well. Well, at the courthouse, you know, it's called a project called Digitizing Black Life and Culture. You know, in middle Georgia, uh, we found, you know, so far up to about 900 uh, records uh, where actually black people were bought and sold right as here. Property. Right, as property right here in Macon, you know, Macon, Bibb County. Uh, and now we have a couple more phases of the project, you know, to, uh, you know, to do. So um, the, the, the entire project itself is, you know, a little bit further out, you know, from from being completed, but we have completed about the first couple of phases of it uh, with the property deeds, records that has these slave transactions, right? But, um, um, and so what we're doing now is we're working with a uh, documentary filmmaker who's going throughout Georgia. It's not just Bacon and Bibb. He's going throughout Georgia and he's looking to record the stories of black people who uh, uh, experienced segregation. Uh, to get literally it from kind of the horse's mouth, you know. Uh, but what was it like, you know, to be a black person in Georgia uh, during the Jim Crow era? During you know, the Jim Crow era, you know. I mean, we and have, I'm one of them. <laughs> yes, you're one of them. We have many, you know, African Americans right here who who, who went through that, uh, those experiences. So um, uh, the value, you know, of that will be immense because um, uh, we all know that. Jim Crow happened. We all know that slavery happened, right? Uh, but we really don't have the voices of those people who actually went through that era. You know, I mean, we have snippets, you know, here and mm -hmm. there. You know, the Eyes on the Prize, for example, did, uh, uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, episodes, you know, on that era, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, interviewed a few people, you know, about their experiences, you know, during those eras. But we're, what we're doing is this, this, this whole program, this documentary film, is going to focus exclusively on people like yourself who were right here in Macon, Bibb, and had to deal with Jim Crow, you know, mm -hmm. um, the issues, you know, involved. How did they make a person feel, for example? You know, I mean, how did they respond to it? How did they try to negotiate space? you know, and, and try to uh, uh, get space for themselves, their families, you know, et cetera, uh, opportunities. How did black people get educated during that era, for example? Um, what kind of options were available to black people, you know, during that time? And then at what point did you know not to cross this particular line, mm -hmm. you know, or they were going to be troubled, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? What about the, the long-term psychological impact? Because we know with here, we're talking about white supremacy now, and, and but there, if there's a white supremacy, that means there's a black, not necessarily, but there was a black inferiority because in, in the order of things in this town, as I recall, and I was uh, 18 when the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. That was my eighth, that's the year my, my graduating class. So up to that time, I'd always lived in a segregated 
and I loved making the time, but always lived in a segregated society. Even though my father would say you were as good as anyone else, right. but yet when I walked out of the door, mm-hmm. everything that met me told me I wasn't. Exactly. So just kind of schizophrenic, if you will, uh, yeah. not young person. That's mm-hmm. true. So uh, when they look at the, uh, have any studies been done as to what what's the psychological impact? Oh yes, I mean there's been much of you know that has been written, you know, research about the kind of psychological impact of that. There was a black psychologist whose name I've forgotten right now, but you know I. Uh, who in fact talks about it as post-traumatic uh, slave syndrome, um, the, the the ways in which that trauma from slavery and also from segregation has been literally encoded into uh, uh, people of African descent, you know, psychologically and also perhaps even genetically, you know, such that uh, there's a lot to overcome, you know, as a result, you know, of that. Uh, that trauma forced, in fact, my family to leave Lake Charles, Louisiana. That's why I grew up in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. you know, because my parents um, uh, uh, were, and, you know, other people around Lake Charles knew how vicious the Klan was. And they came after one of my cousins mm-hmm. um, and uh, accused him of uh, 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 looking at some white woman, you know, uh, with lust or something like that. Um, and they came to my grandmother's, my, mm-hmm. my paternal grandmother's farm, you know, and asked for him. And my paternal grandmother was mean as a snake and said no. Uh, and she stuck a double barrel shotgun out the window and said, the first one of you, you, you white, you know, she didn't say yes. white supremacist, you know, but uh, steps foot on my property, going to go meet the Lord. And so mm-hmm. they didn't come, but then they, they kind of slipped my uh, cousin out of Lake Charles and so my mm-hmm. father, my mother, and two of my uncles and their wives yeah. uh, went out to, uh, to L.A., getting away from the Klan and trying to save my, yeah. uh, my uh, cousin's life. You know, when, you, when I hear these kind of stories and you think the accomplishments that mm-hmm. we've made, in spite of, right. in spite of, here you are, a grandmother flying here on the way here from, right. but here's a grandmother that's chasing someone out to save her son, right. Uh, right. and here the grandson is a professor of a major university in the deep south. Right. So to overcome all that, to mm-hmm. be able to rise above it, I think that take a, a strength that most people don't uh, don't have. Uh, right. Right, you know, other than African Americans, I'm convinced of that. Well, you know, it's something that gets in. That's a strength of character. That's it's a strength of character, and it's something that you know uh, uh, you develop. Right. You don't sit around and say. Uh, as a young person, you know, I got to be strong, you know, I have to be, you know, let me develop the strength, you know, but adversity builds strength, you know, if you survive, with yeah. the, you know, it's kind of like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. The, the task for us, I think, as people of, of African descent is to continue to be strong without being bitter, uh, because bitterness uh, can be uh, very damaging, you know, to us. We can be critical, right, and be aware, right? Uh, but bitterness itself, mm-hmm. you know, Martin Luther King said this, yeah. never let anyone drag you down to their level, you know, so that you hate them, that sort of thing. But at the same time, uh, you never forget what happened. You know, you never forget your history. You never forget what's going, you know, what went on. And for someone like me, someone like you, it's impossible for us to forget, you know. I still remember coming back to, Lake Charles from Los Angeles during the summers with my father and my two uncles. I'm riding in the back seat. And the minute we hit um, the border of Arizona, they start giving me what I call the talk, you know, how mm. to deal with white people, you know. Mm. Uh, so someone, Emmett Till, evidently no one gave no him, one gave that, him talk, that talk. Unfortunate, no one gave him that talk, unfortunate. The young 15-year-old right. killed in Mississippi right. because they say reckless eyeball and reckless looked at a white woman white girl. in the wrong way. He grew up in Chicago. He didn't know anything yeah. about it. Now, getting back to this project that you're working on, there are so many people I'm sure would like to tell stories, have stories to tell. How do they contact, how do they become a part of this uh, documentary, if you will, whatever, for lack of a better word? How they do can, they tell their stories? Then? They can call me. Uh, we'd be more than happy at the to university? have part of them. Yeah, just call me at the university, uh, 478-301-2345. The English uh, department, you're the professor of I'm English. I'm the professor of English, and I'm the chair of chair African, African, African Studies. Right. So it's easy to get you. Right. So, you, so if you have a story to tell, what about white people who experience this? And maybe some 
white people were over here. They had to be over here because they weren't allowed to be over there, and but they wanted to reach out. What about their stories? How important are their stories? Their stories are very important. We're not doing that with okay. this project, right? Not right now, at least. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be a time when we will, but right now we're talking about just you know the African Americans. But I have spoken to um, a number of white people. You know, we had, in fact, one uh, Papa Joe Hendricks at Mercer who literally sacrificed his life, you know, to bring down segregation right here in Macon Bibb. Um, and he and I became, you know, pretty good friends, you know. Father Kyle is another one. Father Kyle Kyle is another Tuffle one. Museum. Started the Tuffle Museum, you know. And the story of, you know, the liberation of people of African descent is not a, sol is not a solitary one, as to say, without the, uh, the help and support and sacrifices of other groups of people, we would have never been able to break the, 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 the yoke of slavery or segregation for that matter. Yeah, Frederick yeah. Douglass talks a lot about that in yeah. his autobiography, yeah. how important the abolitionists exactly. were, you know, to and Quakers course, and all that, right. And of course, what's that guy named the skin of like John Brown? John Brown. <laughs> Brown. We know about yeah, like yeah. John who, Brown. They, who they present as a crazy white man. <laughs> you know, he had to be crazy to yeah. sacrifice himself for black people, yeah. you know, that kind how of thing. How important is it, Doctor? Or to tell this story, to document this history, because a lot of people, like I said, I'm a pro, I'll be 74 in a couple of days, and of course, I was, like I said, 18 when Jim Crow was officially, legally right. over. So, uh, how, how important that we get the story and, and, and told that people can access it? Oh, it's so extremely, future generation. It's extremely important. First of all, uh, it's important, first, to, to capture that, those historical narratives, right? But then second, it's very important because we have a younger generation that doesn't know anything about that. And, and they're not being taught that in schools, right? Anything. Many, many older people don't talk about it with them at home. Uh, they have grandparents and stuff. Uh, but they're not being trained the kind of way that I was, you know, because now they have all this technology and, you know, uh, devices and all that kind of stuff. You know, they, they're working their fingers. Yeah. And we're not talking as much. But access, right? but they have right. more access, to, more information is accessible. They, have, to those, they so. have access to more information, but um, a lot of that information is not accurate. Yeah. Okay. Um, everyone that puts something on the internet doesn't necessarily know what they're talking about. Right? Yeah, that's true. Um, we have about a minute left, and I want to give you an opportunity because I know how near and dear this project is to you mm -hmm. as an individual and as a professor. How can people, again, get in touch with you if they want to have their stories told or if they want to see some of the research you're doing at the courthouse? Maybe they can find their mother, great-great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers. Yeah, well, they can call me at uh, 478-301-2345. That goes directly to my office phone. If I'm not there, just leave a message and I'll call them back. Okay. We're going to be, uh, like I said, we had about 30 seconds. We're going to be celebrating Kwanzaa. Right. Uh, we, we have a young man who's coming on who's going to give us the details, but... Your take on Kwanzaa, is it a worthy holiday? Oh, certainly. Are uh, we celebrating? And how do we get the word out that it's not an anti-white celebration? It's not a, yeah. uh, it's not a black Christmas. We're not trying to uh, uh, replace Christmas with Kwanzaa. Yeah. Well, it's been a misconception. It's a misconception. The one thing that, uh, uh, that people of African descent lost uh, that caused problems in terms of constructing, continuing to construct our identity is we lost ceremonies, rituals, our land, you know, the, the language, you know, et cetera. Kwanzaa uh, was created by uh, Ron Karinga. He called himself Maulana Ron Karinga. Yeah. And as a way of, of developing black rituals yeah. and we black would, ceremonies. Well, I right. appreciate you giving us tidbits. We're going to go into more detail in the second segment with the young man who's uh, in, in charge of the Kwanzaa right. celebration, give us the dates and all of that. But let me wish you a happy Kwanzaa. Happy Kwanzaa to you Merry also. Christmas. Merry happy Christmas. Happy holidays. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Yeah. You know, everything else that's yeah. taking yeah. place. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Dr. Chester Fontenoy, Professor of English and the uh, Director of the uh, Africana Studies. Africana Studies at Mercer University. Get in touch with them if you want to have your story told as to what happened with you during the Jim Crow era here at Macon. Or well, maybe you live elsewhere. We still want to hear your story. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to the Mills Georgia Spotlight. Now we're joined in the spotlight with Vincent Mohammed. Vincent Mohammed is a community servant, and I think that's a very good name compared to a 
a community activist, a political activist, community organizer, but a community servant says it all. And we're going to be talking about Kwanzaa, a holiday that's been around since 1966. It's very Afrocentric, not only for African Americans, it's for all people, but celebrated primarily by African Americans. And we're going to talk to him about the meaning of the holiday and what the different symbols mean that you see here on the uh, on, 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 on the set, on the table. Welcome to our program. Oh, thank you for having me, ma'am. Yeah. And thank you for keeping this alive because you, every year, you, your father, and mm -hmm. other people, Mr. George Muhammad and other people, make sure that you have a celebration. Now, Kwanzaa is celebrated from when to when? December 26th through January 1st. Now, tell us about a little bit about Kwanzaa, the misconception yeah. uh, that people have about it and what it really means. Man, it's a lot. Uh, I've been celebrating Kwanzaa since a very young, young individual, and uh, I appreciate my parents. Number one, going back to uh, Akbar Mhotep, who brought it down from Atlanta. He was a storyteller um, and so much more. But he brought down and actually trained the Kwanzaa Cultural Access Center here in Macon on how to uh, celebrate Kwanzaa. And some of those first pioneers were Brother Abi Ja, which many people know as Kirk Hodges, that's yes. over Homeland Village. Uh, but there was a whole group along with my father, uh, my mother as well, that uh, would start to do these Kwanzaa celebrations throughout. So, as you mentioned, it was started by Dr. Uh, Milana Karenga uh, in 1966. And the thing that people really need to know about Kwanzaa is the principles, because the principles are universal principles that are rooted in Pan-African tradition. These traditions and the uh, Kwanzaa's uh, symbolism are taken from all regions of Africa, from the south, the north, the east, and the west. A lot of it is based on Western harvest festivals, um, and you'll find the harvest theme throughout, uh, throughout Kwanzaa. But we'll start first with just the principles and the, uh, the symbols. Please. So with the principles, when you see, it, growing up in Macon, Georgia, there's a lot of uh, superstition, you know, in the black community. So first of all, you see this black candle, you know what I mean? A lot of people are looking at it and like, why are we lighting a black candle? But the colors are very significant. And when you look at the movement of Marcus Garvey, uh, you have the Bendera Yataifa, which is the flag of liberation that you see here. And those colors represent the red, the struggle. Uh, it was interesting in the previous segment that you talked about Jim Crow and you talked about the civil rights struggle. Everything that we've come to be has come through a struggle, whether it has been uh, warfare or whether it's been spiritual struggle or whatever it is. But it represents that red to make sure that we honor those ancestors who did shed blood through the transatlantic transatlantic slave trade, um, and even before uh, to establish our freedom here and uh, throughout the world, not just in America but throughout the world. Also, the black represents the people. So, like you said, even though this is something that is rooted in the black community, the reason why this is rooted in the black community is because civilization is rooted in the black community. If you look at just colors in general, you know, if we put all the colors together, we get a dark black color. Um, you can say a dark brown, but it's really a dark black color. And out of black, we can get all of the colors of the rainbow. We can get all the colors of humanity. But we have to give honor to the first ancestors that, uh, you know, whether you deal with Dr. Leakey or whoever you deal with that is a historian, they will all point you back to those dark ancestors. So that black represents all of the people, the unity coming together as a black people, but also the unity of humanity. When you look at the green, the green represents the land as well as the fruits of the struggle. So the land is something that has always been something that has given us life. And everything that we get from our clothing to, to our food to the nourishment, the tools that we use all come from the land. But it also represents the fruits of our labor. So from the struggle, the people struggling, we have now you see a chair of Africana Studies at, uh, at Mercer University. You see not only just uh, positions, but also ideas. Our ideas are even stronger than they were before. So with the red, black, and green, you see it once again in the candles, and these represent principles. First is Umoja. And when you hear all of these 
words they come from the language of Swahili. And that's a principle of Kwanzaa. So on the first day, so Kwanzaa is from the 26th to mm-hmm. the first. I mean, that's uh, seven days. Seven days. So yep. the seven days of Kwanzaa. Yes, sir. So every day is a principle of Kwanzaa. Every day. So yes, sir. First one is go ahead again. Is Umoja. So Umoja. Umoja is a Swahili word for unity. And briefly, the Swahili language is something that's used in Kwanzaa because that's a trading language that is used in Africa. No matter where you're from, that's a business language. So it's something that connects all of the languages and all of the people in Africa. Um, so Umoja is unity, and it is for us to have unity in the community, nation, and race. Uh, when you go to the next side, what you would do is you would start with the black candle, then you would go to the red candle for the next day. The red candle, the first red candle represents Kuji Chagulia. Kuji Chagulia is self-determination. And self-determination is so that we can name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves instead of letting others name us, create for us, and speak for us. And this is very important because coming from the transatlantic slave trade, a lot of our ancestors that have come to this country, we don't know our original names. We have adopted the names of those that were on the plantation, the slave masters. But we have so many different names, so many different languages that we can define ourselves and we don't have to be defined as a thug or whatever, you know, label would be put on us. So self-determination is very important. Then we go to the green candle, which is Ujima, collective work and responsibility. And this is a big one, making our brothers and sisters problems our problems and finding out how we can solve them together. Then we go to the next red candle. The next red candle is Ujama. And Ujama represents cooperative economics. This is circulating the black dollar, circulating the dollar in the community, period, and using our economic resources to build strength in our communities. We go to the next green candle, and the next green candle after that is Nia, which is purpose. Purpose, and the beautiful thing about this, too, when I was growing up, I knew people with these names. I knew people that were named Nia, and as we'll go further, we'll see some other names that you may be familiar with. But Nia means purpose. And us remembering our collective vocation to make our community more beneficial than we inherited it. And our purpose to, um, I want to make sure that I get it exactly right. I brought some uh, some notes. Because it's good information. So to make our collective vocation the building and developing our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness. And that's very important because when we look at our community today, I grew up in uh, Fort Hill. I was raised, uh, I was born in a house on Napier Avenue, but I grew up in Fort Hill. And when my parents would show me pictures of what Fort Hill used to look like versus what it looks like now, the same way with Pleasant Hill, it baffled my mind. And I'm trying to figure out how it got to the point where it is today. But if I just look and I'm not connected with my ancestors and I look at dilapidated houses and I look at different things today, I won't know that we have a history of traditional greatness. If I'm not connected with, you know, uh, Queen and Zinga and connected with all of these great okay. leaders in these great communities. So uh, the next is Kuumba, which is creativity. And that's our last red candle that we light. And it's to do always as much as we can in the way that we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. And that's very important because just because we come to a, a situation doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. Mm-hmm. Our last green candle that we would light is for Imani, which is faith. And that's another name. I know many people, you know, growing up, I knew a lot of Imani, young yeah. sisters named Imani. So Imani means faith. And this is where we end the celebration of the cycle because it says to believe with all of our heart. First of all, that belief. If you don't believe in something, then you won't have the, the motivation to actually work and go through the process to realize it and make it happen. With all of our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. What a positive message and, and, and a way to live if we could just get our people to live this yes, way. Sir. But uh, you're doing all you can to promote it. So now this, take, this takes place starting the 26th. Right. A different location yes, sir. for each one of these events. Yes, so the 26th would be the first one, the first candy. Yes, sir. So where is that taking place? We're going to be at the Devilish Theater, uh, I believe 7 to 9 p.m. And we have the Unity Awards. 
So the Unity Awards are going to be recognizing those in the community that have been working to create unity and have been working to further our community as well. And it's also going to be a lot of great live entertainment that night. So the first night is the kickoff. So yeah. that's definitely the celebration that you want to come through for the Douglas. Next night we'll be at the Douglas once again for Youth Night. And this was something that was started at a certain point where my father allowed us as the younger generation to take leadership of that night. So you're going to see youth doing this Kwanzaa celebration. That's really one of the only reasons I can speak on Kwanzaa because I've done it for so long. And now my younger brother hosts um, Kwanzaa. He's a recent graduate of Lamorno in college, Kareem Muhammad, a professional yeah. golfer. And I mean, just a phenomenal young brother. But we'll have a lot of visiting uh, students, you know, yeah. coming in. Okay. So 7 to 9 at the Douglas Theater. Ujima, uh, the next night this location is to be announced. It's going to be Community Solutions for Change, so there will be solution circles. Ujama is a forum on black economic unity. There will be information on status of economics of the black community in Macon and solutions for those uh, for our economic needs in Macon. NIA will be focused on Afrocentricity. Uh, it's the year of the return to Ghana, as we know, in 2019, and discussing experiences of those who have made that trip back to Ghana. Lastly, we have Kuumba, which is a Kwanzaa feast, one of my favorites. We call it the Karamo, getting a chance to get that good eaten. And uh, we have that location to be announced. And Imani is a day of reflection uh, in your household. We encourage the, you to celebrate in your household. So we encourage people to come out to the Douglas, to be involved, do it co uh, cooperatively, if you will, yes. all of us together. But also, you encourage people to celebrate Kwanzaa in their home. Definitely. Just they celebrate their Christmas or Easter or whatever Definitely. in their home. And you made a very good point that this is not a replacement holiday. This is not a competitive holiday. You know, Kwanzaa is what it is, as Christmas is what it is, and Hanukkah and all of these. And we respect and we, we celebrate all of these traditions and cultures. However, with Kwanzaa, we want to make sure that people know that this is something that they can celebrate and something that they can take past January 1st and live every day of their life. And that's, that's the key. And I want to thank you. We're almost out of time, but I want to give the dates again, the 26th of, of January through the fir I mean, 26th of December through yes, the sir. 1st of January. Yes, sir. The dates are primarily at the Douglas. Yep. But I'm sure they can find information in the community, something and elsewhere, definitely. if people are interested and in participate. Yes, sir, definitely. What would, would I give you 30 seconds to close it out. What would you like the people to know about Kwanzaa that we haven't said? Yes, sir. Kwanzaa is a first fruits festival that is a lifestyle. So please take these principles and live them throughout your life. And thank you for having me on the show. Well, let me thank you. I've, I've learned a lot here myself, and I know I celebrate Kwanzaa. I've been celebrated since it's been celebrating this town yes, with, the, with the help of your father and other people. And we've been talking with Vincent Muhammad, who is uh, a community servant. And he also is very knowledgeable of Kwanzaa and one of the uh, 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 people that's putting it on this year and every year. So celebrate Kwanzaa. Go out celebrating your home. Go out to, to the Douglas. And if you need more information about it, you can get in touch with the Tubba Museum, and they'll have information about the dates and that. Without well, it. if you need more information, call 478-718-8067. Say that again. 478-718-8067 for Brother George Muhammad. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, and happy Kwanzaa. Yes, sir. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy Christmas. Thank happy you. Happy Hanukkah. Yes, sir. And happy holidays. And keep up the good work. Yes, sir. We need more young people like you doing what you are doing in this community. We hear so much negativity about the African-American young man, but here's a living example that we can, we do, and we will. Praise God. We'd like to thank all of you for joining us this week, and happy Kwanzaa to you as well, and Merry Christmas, and happy holidays, and happy Hanukkah, and I'll see you next year. Jack Elliott. So long, everybody. Follow us on YouTube now. We're on YouTube. Follow us on YouTube, the Middle Georgia Spotlight. Like us on YouTube as well. You can see us all over the world. So long, everybody.